Good morning and welcome. It's good to have you all here as we gather for worship uh, in person, but also virtually. If you're joining us virtually today and you're a part of worship, uh, would you drop us a line? Let us know that you're a part of our service today, that uh, you're here with us so that we can shout back at you and say thank you so much for being a part of worship. So we gather for worship today, just a heads up, next Sunday, uh, April the 18th. We're going to be blessed with the Whitco Gospel Choir. They're going to be here with us in worship uh, next Sunday, so I'm looking forward to them coming and sharing with us in music uh, in our worship time together next Sunday. Um, as we gather for worship today, I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to lift up a prayer as we start worship today, so please stand. God, thank you so much for this beautiful day, Lord, that you've created. Thank you for gathering your people today here in person, but also, Lord, through the virtual means that we have to be able to gather. And Lord, we ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we worship you today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you join me in singing together, Jesus, keep me near the cross. I did turn my ringer off this week. <clears throat> today's call to worship. Uh, please remain standing for today's call to worship. The winds of change blow. The spirit of God breathes. The dead bulbs burst into blooms. Lilies, tulips, spring. Refreshing raindrops moisten parched mouths of graves. O God of Calvary, O God of the empty tomb, O 
O God of the rushing wind, O God of unfailing grace, Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all nations in Christ's name. We are witnesses of these things. Good morning. And yes, let the children come down. <laughs> you just have to promise not to hug each other, kiss each other, or lick each other while you're down here. Okay? Come on. <laughs> Good morning, it's so good to see all of your faces. It's been, well, hi, Garrett. <laughs> okay, guys, you know what we're gonna talk about today? How many of you know what it means, what's, what is a reflection? Do you know what a reflection is? Yes. <laughs> what, what is a reflection? It does make, and that is one kind of, that's my favorite kind of reflection. And? It does make a reflection. And guess what I have with me? A mirror. Because do, do you ever look in the mirror and see your reflection? And the water can be a reflection. A reflection is when we see, when something comes back to us, right? We can see it. And this mirror has two sides. One, and the other side's really big. I don't like the really big side. I can really see my wrinkles. Um, <laughs> but when you look in this mirror, you see what you look like, don't you? That's the whole idea of a, of a mirror and a reflection. We get to see what we look like. Some, here, take a good peek. Can you see it in there? <laughs> well, today, Pastor Brian's going to talk about re reflecting Jesus. Do you think you can reflect Jesus? When you look in this mirror, can you see, do you see Jesus or do you see Henry? Yeah. <laughs> you see yourself. Okay, now, mirrors can show a lot of things. But they can't, when we look in the mirror, we don't, we can't see Jesus' face, can we? So if we want to reflect Jesus, how do you suppose we could do that? Do you know there's another meaning, because I'm kind of a word nerd, okay? There's another meaning to reflect. Reflect can mean to make obvious or apparent. How can you make, how can you reflect Jesus? How could you make Jesus obvious or apparent? What could you do to make Jesus obvious in your life? Henry? Oh, good answer. You can feel it in your heart and do what he's trying to tell you. What do you think he's trying to tell you? What are some of the things Jesus wants to tell us? You don't remember about that story? <laughs> well, let's remind you. <laughs> Jesus wants us to be kind and loving and generous and helpful. So when you are all of those things, you can reflect Jesus to the world. 
And that's a way we can show Jesus to the world, even though they might not see him when they first look at us. Okay? So how many of you can try to do that this week? Be kind and generous and helpful and merciful, especially if somebody's not so nice to you. <laughs> okay. Let's bow our heads for a little prayer. Okay? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for loving us enough to send us Jesus, your son, and for the example he set for all of us. Please help us follow that example this week so that we can reflect, make obvious his life to the world. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, children. What a blessing. We can learn so much from the comments that kids make. It's such a blessing to have them here with us today. So we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, this week we are going to be sending care packages to our college students. Our college students are, are for the most part, wrapping up their spring semester. And if you remember, if you're in college or if you have college students or you've known college students, this time of the year can be a lot of pressure. Um, so these care packages will land on their doorsteps in their college post office boxes at a prime time to remind them of how much we love them and that we're thinking about them. And as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, just as a reminder, um, we have 15 college students that we're sending these care packages out. And I want to say thank you to those who have donated items, uh, funds to be able to send those out. Um, just as a reminder that these students so much appreciate these care packages. We've heard from many of them that have said thank you so much for thinking about us. But these students also so much appreciate uh, the thought that their home church is thinking about them and their home church is praying for them. Um, so as we go to the Lord in prayer, that's, that's on my mind today. Not only our high school students who will be coming back together here in our community after spring break, our teachers and all that work in the schools, but also our college students who are coming towards the end of their break. We're going to start with a moment of silence, um, and then we'll lift up some prayers, and then I'm going to invite you to join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. God, as we gather and worship, God, thank you. Thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you, God, that you are a strong tower, a rock that we can go to, that you are faithful. Lord, as we walk this journey of life, as we go through all different experiences, as life is good to us, as life is rough on us, God, thank you that you are constant. You are faithful. You are always there. And God, thank you for the reminders that you give to us of your ever-present help. And God, as we gather for worship today, God, thank you for meeting us right here, wherever we are. And God, for being the strength that we need from moment to moment. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for this church family, for the blessing of being able to gather uh, to worship you in the unique ways that we've been able to do that during this crazy time. God, thank you for the opportunities that you've given to us as a church to be able to reach out with love and compassion, with hope and with help to those you've placed in our path. And God, thank you for the many ways that you're working in us individually and Lord, as a church. God, thank you that we're not the only church. We're not the only organization in this community that's offering help and hope and extending arms of love. And God, thank you for each organization, each church, um, each person, in our community that serves and that loves this community and all of the communities that we represent. God, we ask that you would bless these individuals, these organizations, Lord, as they reach out with hope and compassion. Lord, that you would provide for the needs that they have, and God, that you would make a great impact on the world around them. God, this morning we're mindful as we uh, come to you in prayer of, of the many teachers, students, uh, school staff and volunteers here locally in our community, that will be going back into the local schools to teach and to guide our students. Lord, bless them, encourage them. Lord, thank you for this spring break that they've been on, time to rest, to reflect. And Lord, I just ask that you would give strength to our teachers, especially our teachers who are in the classrooms with students right now. 
God, thank you for our college students that we've continued to connect with. Lord, bless them as they come towards the end of their semester, Lord, as projects pile up and as tests loom. Lord, I've just asked that your hand would be upon each one of these college students, that you would remind them of how very much you care for them. And God, that you would remind them of your presence with them as they walk through these times. Lord, as we gather for worship today, we're grateful for this nation, this nation where we enjoy so many freedoms, freedoms that were bought at a very high price. And Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon this nation. God, that you would guide our leaders, give them wisdom, discernment, direction, or that your hand would be upon them as they make decisions that affect so many lives. God, thank you for the women and men who serve in our armed force, uh, Lord, that watch over and protect. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless them and encourage them, that you would guide them in the important work that they do. Lord, we're grateful also for the, again, the many who serve our communities. Lord, our, our uh, first responders, our medical professionals, Lord, those who work in the jails and in the justice systems. And Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon these civil servants as they serve, that you would bless them, that you would guide them, that you would give them wisdom and give them strength, Lord, as they carry out their duties. God, this morning as we gather, we thank you, Lord, for those that you've placed in our lives, those that we're close to, friends, family, loved ones. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your blessing upon them today. Friends and family and loved ones that need your touch, God, would you touch them? Would you bring healing and strength and encouragement and guidance to them? And Lord, I'm mindful of the many who don't have people close to them today. Um, some of them are here with us in person. Some may be connecting with us on the radio or on the internet. God, would you hold them close to you? Remind them of your incredible love for them as well. And God, that you would place people in their lives that would be encouragement to them and would give them strength. God, we're so grateful as we think about reflecting Jesus today. We're grateful, Lord, for Jesus. As we've celebrated his resurrection this past week, God, thank you that you have stepped into this world on our behalf to bring hope and life, new life in you. And God, as we continue to lift these prayers to you, we ask that you would guide us as we lift the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I 
Scripture reading today is from Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 49, and we are reading from the New Living Translation. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said, yes, It was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. The word of God for the people of God. be seated. So we come out of the season of Lent, that season of preparation, those 40 days leading up to the Easter celebration. As we've celebrated Easter last Sunday, um, the great celebration of our risen Savior, uh, we're moving on to another topic. The next uh, seven weeks, we're going to be talking about this word, discipleship. Um, And that's a big word. And it's not a word that we really hear very often in our world today, do we? Um, so in, in, in thought and in thinking about that, just what comes to your mind when you think of the word disciple? And while you're thinking about that, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your holy word. Thank you, God, that you speak to us in powerful ways through scripture. And Lord, as we have heard from scripture today, both in word and song and prayers, God, speak to our hearts those things you would have us hear. Holy Spirit, come and illuminate scripture to us. And God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be pleasing in your sight, our great rock and redeemer. Amen. So in the children's message this morning, thank you, Kathy, so much for that reminder that discipleship um, and that word, if you said that to one of the kids, some of the kids might understand what that means. But a lot of kids wouldn't even understand what that means because it's just not a word that we hear in school or out in the world. We just don't hear that word very often. So thank you, Kathy, for that reminder that discipleship is all about reflecting, reflecting someone else. And as we think about discipleship during the Lenten season, we talked about some ways that we can express our faith. Um, James talks about in the book of James, faith without works is dead faith. Um, And so there's encouragement throughout the scriptures to live out our faith in different ways. And many of you did that. And it's really really neat to hear some of the stories of how you did that with some of the specific ways that we talked about during the Lenten season. 
a lady I talked to this week, she said, Pastor, I just wanted to let you know that when I was in the drive through at Culver's, which is a restaurant here locally, a drive through restaurant, uh, eating, dining as well, she said, when I was going through the Culver's drive through and as she waited in line, because the line, as it oftentimes is at Culver's, was backed up, she thought, you know what? This would be a great opportunity for me to show kindness to the person behind me in line. And that was one of the ideas that was generated from that particular focus on kindness in our worship service during Lent. She said, I think I'm going to go ahead and pay for the person behind me. So she gets up to the, to the checkout area there. And she sees the young fella, and her thought is, you know, this is a great way to bless this person who's behind me. She said, I didn't know who it was. I didn't know how many people they had in their car, how many they were buying for. I didn't know what the bill was going to be. I know I was taking a chance. Uh, but when she got up to the register, and this young man gave her her total for what she was getting, and she said, you know what? Would you please add on to my credit card the person behind me in line? Have they ordered yet? Yes, they've ordered but why are you doing that, was his question. And she thought that was kind of interesting that he even asked that question, but, but it was a great opportunity for her just to share, you know, we've been walking through some ways we can live out faith, you know, real briefly, because she's in a hurry, he's in a hurry. Just practical ways of living out our faith and showing an act of kindness to somebody else totally unaware, totally unexpected. Well, this young fella, he was just flabbergasted. And she thought, isn't that interesting? The person that she was planning to bless to be kind to was behind her in line, and the lady ended up pulling beside her and saying, thank you so much for doing that. Why did you do that? That was such a blessing. This young fella, she said of all of the things that happened in that moment that she didn't expect to happen, this young fella just lit up when she said, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to live out what I believe, my faith in Christ. And uh, so it was an incredible testimony, an incredible witness of how God's love for us and, and how, as we celebrated through that Lenten season, how God does a work in us, changing our hearts and our minds and helping us to live out what we believe. It's not just some uh, platitude in our heads, uh, but it's actually lived out. What an incredible blessing that can be to the person that directly received that blessing, but also to those that witnessed it. Young lady came out with her, with her lunch because she had to pull over to the side, as you oftentimes have to do there. And she brought her lunch out to her, and she just had this big smile on her face, this girl coming out. And, and this lady, she was like, are, are you having a good day? And she said, I am now after what I've seen. And so the word, the word of what this woman did kind of spread throughout the workers there at the restaurant. And what an incredible blessing. And the thing that, that really struck me as she shared this story with me, it, it wasn't so much, and sometimes we can think, oh, look at me, look what I did, aren't I a good one? And it wasn't that. It was, wow, I was obedient in this small thing, and look what God did, way beyond what, what she thought would happen in that moment. And isn't that the way it goes? As we surrender to God, as we walk with God, in that relationship with God. And God does a work on our hearts, changing our attitudes, changing the way that we look at the world around us, changing some of the things that we do, how much of an impact that can have on the world around us. So as we shift now, after celebrating our risen Savior, this incredible thing that happened on Easter morning, as the ladies go to the tomb and they find the tomb empty, as they tell the guys, the guys are like, well, yeah, maybe, I don't think so. And as they, out of curiosity, run to the tomb and find it empty. We come to this story in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And I just encourage you to take a look at this entire chapter. It's a long chapter, honestly. There's a lot of verses in it. It goes into the 50s as far as the number of verses. But take a look at, at Luke, chapter 24. Because in this chapter, we go from the women coming to the tomb early on Easter morning and being freaked out and excited and running to tell the disciples, the disciples, some of them running and checking it out, to a story that took place right after that that Luke focuses in on. None of the other Gospels focus in on this story in Luke chapter 24, but Luke does. And he picks up on this thing of discipleship that we're talking about. And he, he, he makes this understanding of what discipleship is all about. Because in my mind, if you grew up in the church, you hear the word disciple, who do you think of? You think of James, and Peter, and John, and Philip, and Andrew, and Thomas. 
and all of these guys who Jesus encountered along his journey on this earth and said, hey guys, come and follow after me. And they did. And so when we think of the word disciple, perhaps that's what comes to our minds as these 12 who decided to follow Jesus. Well, in this story that follows all of the resurrection, what we see at the beginning of Luke's gospel, in this story, it's the walk to Emmaus. There's two disciples who are making the journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which is a suburb of Jerusalem. It's just seven miles outside of Jerusalem. And they walked this long, lonely road late in the day on Easter. And on their journey down this road, dejected, just in despair, these guys were two of Jesus' disciples, but they weren't one of the twelve. But they were two men who had come to faith in Jesus, probably saw what he did, probably heard what he taught, and had an impact on their lives, and they decided to follow after Jesus. And so as they're walking down this road and really bummed out because of all of the things that had happened in his death, Jesus appears on the road with them. You talk about weird, wild. And you see in some of the gospel accounts of stories of Jesus just appearing during these 40 days after he rose from the dead and before he ascended to heaven, we have appearances and stories of these appearances. And this is one of those times as the disciples, I love this story, you can tell. As the disciples were walking along the road, Jesus suddenly appears with them. And here's the cool thing. These weren't one of the 12, were they? In fact, we don't even know one of their names. We find out one of the others, one of their names later on, Cleopas. But these are two guys, just like me, just like us, that had come to faith in Jesus as they walked the journey of life and as they heard him teach, as they saw what he did, they responded, not one of the 12, but they gave their lives to follow after Jesus. And as he appeared on the road with them, they didn't recognize him. And you know, it's interesting that a lot of these uh, post-resurrection scenes where Jesus appears, not just to these two disciples, but to the 12 or to the 11 that were still there, to the women, they don't recognize him. It's still Jesus. And we find that out throughout as we read the Gospel of Luke chapter 24. We find out it is Jesus. It's not just some ghost that's appeared in their midst. And so as these fellows were walking down the road, Jesus appears. You know how they recognize Jesus? These disciples, who I imagine had been with Jesus for some time, had heard him talk, had heard and seen what he had done, you know how they recognized who he was? He didn't come right out and say, hey guys, it's me, hello, don't you recognize me? Here's how they knew who he was. These disciples who had come to faith in Jesus, they recognized Jesus because he opened the scriptures to them. Scriptures, what scriptures? Well, you know, we think of scriptures as our Bibles. Um, right now, unfortunately, we don't have them in the pews because of COVID. Um, but we think about the Old Testament and the New Testament. But scriptures to the people at that time, it was the law, the prophets, what we know as the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs. And so as Jesus spoke the scriptures to them, you know what he was talking to them about? He was talking to them about Messiah. But not Messiah like what they thought Messiah would be. He opened the scriptures to them to help them to understand that Messiah would have to suffer and that Messiah would have to die, but that on the third day he would rise again. And as these disciples heard Jesus talking about that, as they reflect on that, they say their hearts were just burning inside because what they were hearing, ah. And as they came to the place where they lived and they broke bread, Jesus broke the bread, their eyes were opened. They recognized him and bam, Jesus was gone. And that's where we pick this story up as we come back together. These two guys who had gone way out on their walk to Emmaus had come back into Jerusalem because they wanted to tell the disciples. You know, there was rumors going around that Jesus had risen from the dead. Um, some of them believed it, sort of. Some of them were like, I hope this is true. Some are like, yeah, I don't think so. And so they came back into Jerusalem to meet with the disciples and tell them this is what we saw. These two fellows, they weren't one of the original twelve, these two disciples were living out what a disciple does. And I want you to think again about what that word disciple means in your mind. What were some of the thoughts that came up in your mind? Um, and then thinking also about what Kathy shared with the children's message of reflection. A disciple is someone for whom we try to pattern our life after. Um, disciple can also be a teacher. 
Uh, oftentimes in uh, first century Israel, uh, men would, would try to find teachers, rabbis, that they could follow, that they could listen and learn from, that they could pattern their lives after. You see, it wasn't just gaining knowledge. It wasn't just like when we go to school and we sit in a class and we listen to our teacher and we try to remember everything our teacher says, write down notes and keep it in our minds so that when the test comes, we can write down the answers on the test and get an A. A disciple would follow their teacher and pattern their lives after their teacher. And I love the reflection analogy. They would try to be just like their teacher. That's what a disciple was. And so as that word disciple is used in scripture, um, and, and those of you listening are part of worship that may never have even heard that word before. And I realize that that's a good possibility because it's just not used that much. A disciple is someone who follows someone else and you think about that, celebrities, sports figures, um, important people in our, our culture and our society, people that, that do things that we admire, that we, we uh, respect and, and we, we really love about people, and we try to pattern our lives after those people. That's kind of what a disciple does, is they see what the teacher, the leader, whatever does, and tries to pattern their lives after that. And so these disciples, as they followed after Jesus, they wanted to be like Jesus. There may have been people in your own life, and I'm thinking of one person in particular in my own life, um, and that was my youth director growing up and in high school. I loved him, and, and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to pattern my life after him, and, and I kind of did. He ended up becoming a pastor, and, uh, and so I kind of patterned my life after that. Um, so you can think of people in your own life that had a great influence on you that maybe you looked up to. You thought, you know, I want to be just like that, maybe a parent or a grandparent. And so these disciples, as they walked with Jesus, and they watched what he did, and they saw what he did, and they were inspired, and they wanted to be like that. That's what these disciples were all about, was following Jesus and emulating Jesus and being like Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus went and messed it all up for these disciples. Because in their minds, they thought Jesus, the Messiah, was coming with power, with authority, and he did but they thought he was coming to change everything in the system, and he really did, but not in the way that they expected. When Jesus shared, and it was interesting, I looked back in the Gospels, and there's three different Gospels that talk about this, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you look at those accounts of Jesus, he feeds the multitude, remember that? When he comes and he multiplies the food, and all the people are just wowed by that. But then he asks the question, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that your uh, teacher, your rabbi is? And so they, they try to think of some things to say. You know, you're, you're Elijah, or you're, you're this, or you're that, you're the great prophet. Peter comes right out with it, and he nails it. And he says, well, you're the Messiah. And right after that, listen to this. These disciples who wanted so much to pattern, they'd given up everything to follow after Jesus. Jesus tells them, if you want to be my disciples, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow after me. And he goes on to explain in all three of those gospels, he says, God bless you, I'm going to have to suffer, I'm going to have to die, and then on the third day, I will rise again. You may want to hear that. In fact, Peter speaks up and he says, no, Lord, no, 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 that's not how it's supposed to work. I've got it in my mind how this is supposed to work and that's not it. And then Jesus comes back to them and says, you know what? If you want to be my disciple, if you want to pattern your life after me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily, follow after me. Fast forward into the upper room in our account today from Luke's gospel as the disciples are gathered there with these two that had come from Emmaus and met with them in the room and said, hey guys, we've seen him. And they're like, yeah, I've heard that story. And what happens? Jesus appears again. I love it. This is, I mean, you can't make this stuff up. He appears again in the room with them. And they are startled to death. They said, oh my goodness, there's a ghost in the room. And they didn't recognize him. And he goes on to demonstrate who he is. First of all, he says, peace be still. Guys, it's me. And he takes broiled fish that they had. Could you all have something to eat? I mean, if you go into somebody's house, you got something to eat? 
they bring out the broiled fish, and he eats it right in front of them. He says, guys, it's me. And he reminds them. And I love how the scriptures tell us that, that um, he opens their minds to be able to recognize. We saw that with these two on the walk to Emmaus. We see that in the upper room with these disciples that are just kind of like, what is going on? He opens their minds to understand. What is it that he's helping them understand? He's helping them understand who he is and what he has come for. To fulfill the law and the prophets. Messiah, who suffered and gave his life so that we could have new life. And as the disciples heard him talking and recognized who he was, I love how Luke says they were so filled with joy. If you've been in a hopeless, desperate situation, and all of a sudden there's a ray of light, there's a glimmer of hope, and you grasp hold of that. That's what these disciples were doing. They recognized Jesus. And here's the thing. Jesus said, okay, guys, okay, ladies. And keep in mind, there were ladies there, too. This was a whole community that had gathered together there, not just the eleven. He says, here's what I've got for you. You really want to be my disciples? What is a disciple? Somebody who patterns their lives after their teacher. Does what they do. Lives like they live. He said, here's what I have for you. I'm calling you to be witnesses. Witnesses of what? What does a witness do? A witness shares testimony about something that they've seen or experienced firsthand. I want you all to be witnesses of what? Witnesses that he's risen from the dead. But hear this, also witnesses of all that he opened their minds to be able to understand, the law and the prophets, fulfilled in him. Open their minds to be able to understand and to witness that Jesus came, lived among us, suffered, and died. But on the third day, rose from the dead. That's what we're called to share. There are so many different things as Christians that we can share with our world. There's kindness, like I shared just a moment ago. And that's awesome. The problem is that those can just be acts of kindness, acts that we do, following through on certain things. But what Jesus calls us to do, he calls us to do those good acts. But he calls us to do just the same thing that he did. What did Jesus do? He laid down his life. He surrendered his life. He didn't have to. And you and I don't have to. You and I have every right and every ability to hold on to our lives, to do what we're doing. But what Jesus did was he did what he saw the Father doing. And he came as a humble servant. And he calls us to do the very same as his disciples. So a disciple of Jesus patterns their lives after Jesus. And if we pattern our lives after Jesus, it's going to look a lot like what Jesus did what Jesus said, and what Jesus was, was all about, and that was laying himself down and serving. And that's not a popular message in our world and our culture. It wasn't a popular message at Jesus' time. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted a Messiah who would come in and rescue God's people on a white horse, a stallion. And that's not what Jesus was about. So as we think about discipleship, and we're going to be unpacking this a little bit more as we go through these weeks in preparation during this season of Easter, preparation for Pentecost Sunday coming up in May. So we go through this and talk about what a disciple is and what a disciple does. A disciple is someone who reflects. Thank you, Kathy. Couldn't think of that word, reflects. And we're called to reflect the very love, self-giving, sacrificial presence of Jesus in our world today. You know what? I don't have it. You don't have it. But God gives us the ability as we walk this journey of faith with Jesus to do just that. And it's not easy. Not easy at all. God, thank you that you call us to this journey of faith. And it's a journey of surrender. It's a journey of giving up. And it just seems counter to everything that our culture puts before us. But God, it is the way of love that you demonstrated in Jesus, who have, having every right 
to be on a throne, to be respected, honored, and worshipped, came as a humble servant, called disciples to follow after him and to do this very same thing. And God, I know you call us in our world, whatever it is that we do, wherever we are in this world. God, you call us to follow after you in that same way. So God, help us to be faithful witnesses, faithful witnesses of Jesus who gave himself up for us and who lives eternally. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. Last week after worship got done and we had our little post-worship discussion, it's like, I felt like there was something missing. And it's like, oh yeah, we were going to present the offerings before the communion time. And it's like, duh. Brian whispers to me, um, I think we're supposed to have candlelight, aren't we? <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking and thinking, yeah. Um, and, and that happens, doesn't it? And so I'm not forgetting that we're going to present the offering today. So um, as they prepare the offering, one thing I wanted to mention is just a big thank you. You guys are so generous. Um, those of you who are here present, but also those that connect virtually. Uh, one of our, our mission focuses during Easter was the Beeman Home. Um, it's a local shelter for the, the abused here in our community for families and individuals. Y'all raised, and it's in the bulletin, and you may have seen it, we've raised over $800 to go towards the Beeman Home. So thank you, thank you so much. That will be such a blessing to this important uh, home in our community. Um, and please um, also here, thank you for your generous donations of those pill bottles for Ryan's case. Um, what a blessing. Y'all are pouring that in. So thank you so much for your generosity. Would you all please stand as we receive the offering today? God, thank you for these gifts, these tithes, these offerings. Lord, we ask that you would bless these gifts. May they be used to further your kingdom and to bless many. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Let's sing, Thine Be the Glory.
part of worship today as we go out into the world. We're carrying a virtual light with us today. But carry the light of Jesus' presence as you go into the world. God bless you. That's the virtual. <laughs> we even talked about it. I know. <laughs>